Hello everybody, here we are in the second edition of New Talk Argentina and uh, yesterday I had really the pleasure to see a very good show with Fran Joven. Um, she was playing fantastic music, uh, I had no idea how it was made and also the visuals were really tricky so when I found her later I had to ask. But first, questions first. Franz, how are you? I'm fantastic, thank you. Franz, is this your first time then uh, bringing your show then out of your hometown? This was a world premiere, so it was the actual first time ever performed. Wow. Yeah. So we had the premiere. So tell me, um, what then does um, Mutech represent for you in terms of um, you know coming out of the country or visiting places? Tell us about then the tour you've been making on, on these shows or previous shows as well. Well, Mutech Buenos Aires is a first for me. Uh, I'm obviously familiar with Metec Montreal since it is my hometown, so I've been fortunate enough to have been uh, present at the first Metec. And uh, so this, um, how can I tell you this, like this was very important for me in terms of where, what direction my, my practice would take. So in that sense, Mutec was extremely influential and, and inspirational in those early years because of all the artists that I was exposed to, you know, to during that time. Um, this tour has been quite interesting for me because I'm mostly in Medellin at the moment. And uh, so I was in Medellin in uh, July to perform a concert in the context of um, Auditum, which was a festival um, held in Medellin for a week. And uh, I'm returning um, after Mutech Argentina to continue a workshop. Fantastic. Now tell us then about your career as a musician, because we all come from somewhere. So what was that kind of approach uh, between the music and you? Because then to get what you do today, there must be some kind of background, but something really made a spark. So in your case, what was it? Okay, I will try and give you the condensed version. Okay, I was trained as a classical pianist when I was a kid. I had serious issues with interpreting classical music because in my mind, uh, I could not sit down and have a, con a conversation with the composer. Therefore, I could not know what state of mind the compo composer was in when he was composing a piece. So how am I supposed to interpret this without knowing it? Mm -hmm. I, I think I was also somewhat of a rebel and I felt that, you know, I had my own music that I wanted to put out. And so uh, that's age 12. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, quite the rebel. And then, so I quickly switched to popular music of the day, and uh, through a strange, strange circumstances, a uh, sense of circumstances, I ended up in a blues band as a keyboard player. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first problem I found with playing blues in a blues band with a keyboard is that the sounds are not adequate in the sense that you need a piano to sound like a real piano, you need a Hammond B3 organ to sound like a Hammond B3 organ, you need a full horn section to sound like a full horn section. And so this were, was really my um, initiation to programming sounds because I had to make it sound real. And so I started utilizing synthesizers and rack mount to double up and layer things and get better sounds and so on, to the degree that when I would get a synthesizer, I would completely flush the sounds that came in and I would start from scratch. So this was really my school for programming. Um, second important thing about blues is that it taught me about the architecture of sound. When you're playing blues, you travel one weekend, you're in a city, the next weekend, you're in another city, you're constantly traveling. The venues are always new and you never know where you're going to play. So you need to adjust very quickly to this dynamic of, uh, of, of a bar, a club that is not necessarily suitable for sound and you have a full band and a vocalist and a guitar, drums and everything. So this was my school for the architecture of sound within a space. And thirdly, I think blues was my first experience with minimalism. Uh, blues is often misunderstood as a uh, simple music, uh, three chords and that's it. But there's a whole idiom behind that and there's a whole feel behind that, that if you're not able to capture, you're nowhere near 
where you should be. So that would be my first experience in minimalism. And during that time, um, I met a musician who asked me to come and jam with him. So uh, I went to the studio with this musician and uh, he started playing this music which I'd never heard before. And uh, so as I would do with any other musical situation with jams, I listened until I could figure out what to play with this. And I started playing and this came out of me like effortlessly. And he was playing experimental music and I just didn't know. And at that point, I realized that, wow, that, that was the moment where I thought, okay, this is what I've been looking for since age 12. So I went back to the blues band and told them I will honor all my contracts until the end. And after that, I'm out. And they thought I was crazy. And uh, that was 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously that worked out. <laughs> Definitely. So when you discover this, uh, this is what I want to do. You found really your key uh, then to composition. Yesterday we had then a quick, uh, a quick talk after your show, and you told me that your actual project is inspired by physics, quantum physics. Yes. So, so that's also interesting. How do you relate then quantum physics onto the actual show then to? Uh, how do you translate that into sound? Okay. Uh, in particular, with the, the concert last night, it's called uh, Intrication in French, which is entanglement in English. Uh, so it's based on quantum entanglements. With this situation last night, uh, with Intrication, the object was to really create sounds within a system where they all relate, but they're separated in any point in time but it creates a whole kind of thing. But I really go through many transitions during this concert and many transitions in terms of mood, in terms of amplitude, in terms of um, even if we want to talk music, in terms of keys and notes, and, and it, it really transforms itself. But it's part of a whole. So my interest is in applying certain concepts of quantum physics to my practice in sound as my uh, my interpretation of those concepts into composition and sound so the idea would be perhaps that you have a certain set of synthesizers inside uh, then your system you tweak them in a certain way but they must be present at all times is that the kind of idea yeah yeah yeah, they're always, I mean, my practice is all based on field recordings now. So um, a lot of it is, uh, I would say, like the major part of the work is really the sound programming. It's really where I'm extremely picky, like really completely mental perfectionist. So the sounds for me are, are the most important thing. If the sounds are good, then I can go and, and I have no problem with composing, creating a piece and so on. So like yesterday you had like textures, you had uh, moments where there are rhythms implied, but they're not rhythms. It's, just, it's, it's a very intricate kind of thing. There are certain rhythms implied in the thing, but they're textures, they're not beats. Not yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, there, there are many things that are implied, but not uh, so present that someone would make that association. It's very important for me that the um, listener and the public is able to uh, take this in as a very personal experience. It's not a concert, it's a physical experience. Um, what kind of software are you using to produce, uh, for example, your um, field recordings, mm -hmm. favorite places that you, ha you have? Do you have any of those? Like, uh, I'm going to certain places because I know what what I want to find. Mornings, evenings, you know, fields, cafeterias. What are those places you are exploring right now? Uh, what happens to me actually is that I really, because I'm so ruled by my ears, mm -hmm. uh, it's how I discover a city. So most people will decide to go, I'll go here and I'll go there. I kind of walk around and the sounds guide me. And this is how I discover a city. And then when I hear something that I like, which is to me very different, I will record it. Something that I'm not used to. Because the, my practice is also based on many sounds that we hear in our daily lives. And we've learned to tune out. There's many, like, I'm sure you don't hear your fridge at home. Sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes I can feel it calling me. Yes. <laughs> so most of these sounds that are very omnipresent in our daily lives and that we learn to tune out is mainly what I work with. I kind of like to 
recycle sounds in a way and have people re-listen to them in a way that they're not in the original state but they're still listening to their fridge <laughs> so. and they don't even know so which is tricky playful <laughs> and witty <laughs> it's really good so uh, tell us then about your perception of electronic music in general then in canada where you're living now uh, and so because we always think okay yes we have chicago new york we have berlin but what about canada i i, I'm, I think there must be something that we're missing uh, for the rest of the world Yeah, Montreal is very uh, Montreal is very active in term in terms of electronic music for many reasons, um, because of the festivals, of course, that we have. Uh, we're very uh, media arts oriented, uh, and 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 that is supported by the funding bodies and governments and so on. So I would say that for that reason, it's much easier to. Um, evolve in that direction because the support is there and the infrastructure uh, infrastructure is there there's many art centers and many places we can go sit down and 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 learn you know uh it's also in schools now which was not when i w when i started you know like there was no school for me 25 years ago to go and learn this so it's interesting now that they have programs of electronic music and so on so montreal is quite big that way and i think that the um uniqueness of montreal is the fact that it's bilingual so we have two scenes we have a french scene and an english scene mm -hmm. and so the approach is also very different and you hear it in the sound yeah okay. Can we say that we also have French touch in Canada for that way of playing house music? French, sorry? The French touch. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. Yeah, you can hear the difference, I would say. Yeah, yeah. So you have two and one. That's also interesting. I visited Canada many years ago and in that in that um, that time, I didn't see the, um, the evolution of electronic music there, uh, except for some clubs I visited uh, during my visit. But then... Um, What is then uh, your vision of then experimental electronic music uh, then from here, let's say 10 years, 20 years? What do you think it's the direction anyone could take? Or how, how do you think this is going to be seen And then in the future? Like we are pioneers or okay, you were wrong. So what's your idea on your own walk? <laughs> uh, my idea is this, um, you know, like when Dizzy Gillespie came out in jazz, You know, everybody thought, what on earth is that? That's not even music. And that's pretty much what happened to electronic music. And I can see now that electronic music is becoming mainstream because I hear it in advertising. In North America, it's used all over the place in advertising. So I think the technology itself um, will probably, you know, like, yeah, okay, sorry, I need to reorganize my thoughts. So the technology has made it with electronic music that anyone can pretty much do electronic music. You no longer have to go to a studio and pay studio fees and so on. That's completely changed where you can have your studio at home now. So for that reason, uh, we have a lot, uh, much, many more producers than you would have of the traditional music. But, but at the same token, um, the really good ones will... Uh, survive over the years you know i used to say um you know like my, my idea for instance would be like if you take Jimi hendrix and the telecaster and the wawa pedal there's a whole lot of kids who bought a telecaster and a wawa pedal but there was only one hendrix or one clapton or so on so i think electronic music is in that stage now where many people are coming out and doing this and we're already there in terms of who stands out more and who's having uh, uh, longevity in terms of career and so on so it's already there at this time now in terms of where it's going to go that's very difficult for me to to uh to approach i'm not quite sure in terms of i think it's because electronic music is very much dependent on technology i think technology will actually have a say in that and then let's hope that the artists will take over and then take it where they need it to go that would be my hope but it may not be what happens <laughs> <laughs> so after you have done shows and visited places and such do you go to clubs do you go to dance then electronic music i'm going tonight okay <laughs> absolutely i'm going to dance to atom tonight of yeah, course too. yeah yeah exactly. so. it's not only just the creation but also to have fun with what others have done which is also so good then to to see and visit what's going on you have to 
you have to remain open. You have to always remain open and not close yourself to certain things. And uh, there are absolutely fantastic producers who are out there and doing all kinds of music. And, you know, w when I look at it, there's really, to me, there's no genre of music. There's good music. And there's bad musicians, <laughs> you know? So when the music is good, like, of course, go and enjoy it and have fun. And the, the beauty about electronic music is that you get all of this uh, palette of various flavors and so on that you will get, you know, like sets like, uh, like Atom tonight and you will get a set like Acufen last night. You know, and that's the and, and you will get, you know, like all these wonderful artists from Argentina and their spin with the Latin rhythms and so on. You know, it's fantastic. So you've heard it. It's not only just the experimental music. It's only also about having fun and having having life then with other artists as well. So that, that's really great. And then to hear from, you know, an artist and especially in this kind of festival that we have that is so cutting edge. But it's also, you know, it's everything is connected in some way. So we, we must and we must remain open minded, yeah. really. And now my last question will be, what is your message to all of your fans and to our audience? <laughs> all of my fans, audience and sales, stay healthy, um, continue going to all these festivals and, you know, support your, the artists that you like and, you know, experience take part in this experience and, and celebrate with us what the music is and what art is because there's more to life than going to work and going to war and all of this stuff. So I would say while we are united in this festival, let's connect. <laughs> so you have that. These are words and wisdom from Franz Joubert. So uh, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much. People keep on listening to Vitamina DJ News. Thank you.